got your Bibles, I want us to go over to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, as we conclude our message in the life of Elijah. And we're going to look in Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, as we look at this final uh, uh, thought in this uh, study on the life of Elijah. Matthew, chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Here's what the scripture says. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, take, uh, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell uh, face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up, and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. So today we come to the last in our Bible study or in our series of studies on the life of Elijah. And we've actually really traveled a lot of distance. We've really come a long way, baby, if you will. I mean, we've looked at a lot of things. We looked at the preparation of the life of Elijah. And you remember how we saw the boot camp basics that he put the life of Elijah through? You remember how he called him that introduction of the man when he walked into uh, the palace with disregard for all of the proper protocol, and he just put his bony finger in the face of Ahab, and he said, here's what's going to gonna happen. It's not going to rain for the next three years. You're not even going to have any dew. God's going to turn the spigot of heaven off, and this is the way it's going to be. It's going to be dry as the Sahara Desert. It is going to be dry. And, um, and then you remember how he took him, put him at the brook Cherith, and, uh, and fed him there with the ravens and with the river and with a drink as well. And uh, he just prepared him for what his ultimate purpose was. And so he took him to the brook Cherith, and then he went to Zarephath and the widow woman there. And you remember that whole series of what happened in that whole scenario. And then from there, you remember he told him to get up and uh, to go to that next place and to do that next thing. And so we saw the pattern of, of the life of Elijah, and that was that he was an obedient type of individual. He was always walking with the Lord. And and he was just, it was almost like God was just on his shoulder. And God was just talking to him, and, and he was talking to God, and the word of the Lord came to, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And as he heard the word of the Lord, he just did. As the word of the Lord came, he just obeyed. So we've seen the preparation of his life. We've seen the, the pattern of his life, which was obedience. We've seen the purpose of his life. And you remember the purpose of his life was all revealed to us atop Mount Carmel. You remember how atop Mount Carmel, he literally put the put to flight the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal and all the prophets of Asherah literally dealt a death blow to them and turned the entire nation of Israel back to God, brought revival to the nation of Israel. They had been uh, playing the part of the harlot. They had been uh, uh, playing uh, uh, the part of idolaters. And so I, uh, Elijah came along. He was an ordinary man, a normal man, just like you and me, not, not anybody of any great background or credentials. And yet God used him to turn an entire nation back to him. So he brought revival. That was really the whole purpose for which God laid hold of him and, and used him in history. And then you remember we saw the power of his life, which was prayer. And this was a guy who the Bible says even in the New Testament talks about how he, it was the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. And talks about how Elijah was a righteous man who prayed much. And so... That was the real undercurrent of his life. That was the real power of his life. And, and we even looked at the problem of his life. And you remember how the problem of his life was he got depressed, he got discouraged, and even though he had done all of this for God, and even though he had been so uh, uh, life-changing for the nation of Israel, he didn't feel like he had done a whole lot. And Jezebel come along and said boo one day and scared his pants off. So he went running. And, and just got in the doldrums, got all in despair and discouraged, you know, because somebody scared him. Jezebel came along and said something to him and said she was going to take his life. 
And so he went and said, Lord, well, just kill me. I've had enough. I haven't done anything for you. I haven't put out any effort for you. I'm not, I'm not really helping you any, so just kill me. Just take my life. And you remember how God took care of him, fed him a little bit, gave him some biscuits and gravy, and got him some rest and some exercise, and got him back on, on track. And you remember how then uh, everything was restored for him. But that was the problem of his life. Even the best of us, the best of us have our worst days. And so that was the problem. And then last week we looked at the parting of his life and how he was taken. He was literally translated by God in a whirlwind from this earth into glory. And so that's sort of the life of Elijah. So we've covered a lot of ground. We've looked at a lot of stuff on the life of Elijah. But now this morning what I want us to do is finish up with what I'm calling the permanency of the prophet which simply means the ongoing continuation of his life. Even though he was taken from this earth in a whirlwind and translated into glory, even though he was taken away from this earth, we see that he's here in Matthew chapter 17. And guess what? He's alive and well. He's alive and well. And so that's what I really want us to see this morning. Now, you know, you've heard uh, that old saying that says, you know, all good things must come to an end. Well, in the Christian life, that's not true. In the Christian life, the truth of the matter is that all good things don't have to come to an end. Truth is, things can just get better and better and better. And, and the reason is because there is, the, there is the hope that we have that is beyond the here and now. There is the hope that we have of tomorrow, which will always be promised to us as better than what we have here and now today. And so what we want to look at this morning is how 850 years after he was taken off this planet, that Elijah is still alive and well. Here's what that in essence really is. In essence, it's the same thing that Jesus said to Martha outside the tomb of Lazarus. You remember what she said? Here's what she said. He said, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, even if he dies, shall live. Everyone who believes in me shall never die. And that's really the final lesson that we get from the life of Elijah. And that's the thought that I really want us to finish up with today. And listen, any man, any woman, any person who has served the Lord Jesus, who has trusted the Lord Jesus, who has trusted him and taken Jesus to be their Lord and their Savior, whether it be an Elijah, a Moses, an Abraham, a Peter, a Paul, or whoever, a Richie Lewis, a Cynthia, a Jimba, whoever it is, that man, that woman, that boy and that girl is going to live on and on and on, even if they die. Now, that's a powerful thought. That's an incredible thought. But that's the lesson that we get from the life of Elijah in this last part. And so what's so powerful is that because of the continuation of his life, there's a couple of things that we get to see uh, because of the fact that his life goes on and on. The first thing we get to see in this passage is the conversation that he has. His conversation. Now, this chapter really is an incredible chapter. I mean, we this is a sight to behold here because we're fortunate to get in on something in Matthew chapter 17 that most folks never really get into, never really understand. Because here's what's happening. God just pulls back the veil uh, of heaven, if you will, and he's allowing us to see something here that encroaches on the eternal side of things it's that mountaintop experience where peter and james and john who are the elect of the elect where they are taken by jesus to the top of the mount of transfiguration and they are given this glimpse into glory after jesus was transfigured that no people really generally speaking on this earth will get to see and so i want you to know that to be here on top of this mountain 
with Jesus, with the elect of the elect, with Peter, James, and John, is a, is, a, is a privilege that most folks don't ever get in on. And most folks don't really even appreciate. We're literally in the ranks of the eternal here. And here's what's fascinating to me about this particular passage. What's fascinating here is the topic of conversation that's going on. Did you notice, according to verse 3, that Moses and Elijah appeared to the disciples talking with Jesus? Did you see that there? They're talking with Jesus. But guess what they're talking about? You know what they're talking about? Luke chapter 9 tells us what they're actually talking about. Luke says that they were actually speaking of the exodus of Jesus. That is, they were speaking of the departure of Jesus that he was about to undertake at Jerusalem. Now, let's translate that. You know what that means? You know what they were talking about? They were talking about the death, the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what they were talking about. They were talking about Jesus going to Jerusalem. And you remember how the Bible says that he set his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. That's, that's, that simply means that he steeled his countenance. There was nothing that was going to turn him away from going to Jerusalem. And that simply means he was going to die on the cross. He knew what he came to this earth for. He knew what God had sent him for. And so that's what he was doing. That's where he was going. And so he was going to die on the, on the cross he was going to be buried in a borrowed tomb, but he was going to raise up three days later. And that was the topic of conversation that was on their lips when they saw Jesus transfigured. Now, here's what's powerful to me, and here's why I like that. Because the more I read my Bible, the more I realize that in that continued state of eternity, when we're living with Jesus in that state, the more I realize that the topic, that the theme of our conversation is going to be this, Jesus. That's it. That's going to be the topic of our conversation. I'm convinced the one thing that's going to be central to every conversation that goes on in heaven is that Jesus Christ has died, he has shed his blood on your behalf and on my behalf, and that he lives to this day as our Redeemer and as our Savior, as the one who brought salvation to our lives. That's going to be the theme of our conversation in heaven. You know, every now and then, and I've had this over the last 30 years of ministry, every now and then somebody will come up to me and say, well, you know what, I guess I'll just ask Jesus that when I get to heaven. I guess I'll just ask the Lord about that when I get to heaven. And nine times out of ten, you know what it is they're talking about? They're talking about either some, some obscure verse in the Bible that nobody can figure out, or some random event, or some strange occurrence that has happened in their life, and they can't figure it out. It's sort of an enigma. It's sort of a mystery to them. And so they say, well, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ask Jesus about it. I guess I'll just ask God about it whenever I get to heaven. Now, let's think about that. Let's think about that just a minute. Can you imagine all of, all of Christendom, all of history has converged and join the eternal ranks at that point, and now everything has centralized, everything has elevated Jesus in that eternal rank, in that place of glory. And we were to walk up and say, now Jesus, I always wondered, why were there seven heads on that dragon instead of four? I mean, you think that's going to, you know, really stand out? Or, 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 or something like, you know, what was that thorn in Paul's side? Who was that mysterious Melchizedek fellow over there in the Old Testament that nobody knows who he is? Well, do you think that's really going to be what we focus on? Do you think that's really going to be the topic of your conversation? And that's the way, or do you think that everything is going to be centralized in what Jesus has done for us through salvation? Well, there you go. That's what it's going to be. That's the theme of our conversation in heaven. And that's exactly what they were talking about here and now. When Jesus was transfigured, that was the subject that was on their tongues. Did you know that in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, there are 14 songs that are sung? 14 songs that are sung in the book of Revelation. And did you know that in some way, every single one of those songs 
is about Jesus and the death, burial, or resurrection of him in some way. Every one of them. Listen, listen to a couple of the stanzas. Here you go. It's talking about a new song being sung. And here's what it says. Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals. For thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men for every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him be glory, dominion, who released from our sins by, who released us from our sins by his blood. That's just a couple of them. Every one of them in some way is about Jesus and the gospel and what he did at the cross of Calvary. And that's just, that's just a, a, the beginning of those. And so the Bible says that Elijah and Moses were actually talking with Jesus. But Luke clarifies it for us, and he makes sure that we understand what they were talking about was the departure at the, his exodus at Jerusalem. In other words, they were talking about the cross. They were talking about salvation. They were talking about redemption. That was the topic of conversation. And so, first of all, one of the things we get to get in on and we get to see because of the continuation of the life of Elijah is the topic, the theme of his conversation. But not only the conversation that he had, also his countenance. Matthew, I think, misses this point. But this is a point that needs to be held on to and needs to be understood. Luke gets it. Matthew misses it. Luke in chapter 9 says this, verse 30 and 31. He says this, And behold, two men were talking with him. They were Moses and Elijah. Now Moses is representative of, of the period of the law. And Elijah was representative of the period of the prophets. And so we recognize that. But then he says this. Two men were speaking with him. They were Moses and Elijah. Who appearing. He says parenthetically. Appearing in glory. Were speaking of his departure. Which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now did you hear that parenthetically. Who appearing in. Moses and Elijah. Who appearing in glory. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. I do not believe that that means that Elijah or even Moses was glorified yet. According to the Bible, Jesus is the first fruits of our glorification. In other words, Jesus was the first human to ever be raised again to never die again. Did you hear that? Because there were some people in the Bible, there were some, some human beings who were raised, right? Who's one of them? Say it. Lazarus was raised from the dead. The Bible says that he was, that the Bible clearly tells us he, had been dead. he was so dead he stunk. It, the decomposition phase had already begun. And so he was dead as dead gets. And yet Jesus raised him from the dead. Now the thing that's significant about that is that there came a day when he died again as a human being. Now we've already looked at a fella here under Elijah. Little boy, you remember how he was raised from the dead. But you know what happened? He died. Another, uh, there was a day when he died a human death. Now, Jesus was the only one who was raised from the dead but he never died again. He was glorified. He received a glorified body. And so Jesus at this point here has not even gone to the cross. So I don't believe Elijah or Moses were in their final glorified state. But I do want you to see that according to Matthew chapter 17 verse 2. That Jesus was transfigured before them. Now what's that mean? That literally means that he transfigured himself. What's that word in our understanding? It means metamorphosis. Just like a little old a butterfly comes out of that little egg and a, and a caterpillar and a little cocoon. And then he comes out this beautiful butterfly. That's a metamorphosis. That's a complete metamorphosis. It's a cycle through which that butterfly goes. Well, Jesus was metamorphosized. He transfigured himself in front. Of, in other words. This wasn't the glory of God shining on him. 
the glory that appeared here was the glory that was within him already. He, he was the glory of God. He was the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God. His human flesh could hardly contain the glory that he had within him. And so his glory was shining through. His brilliance was being revealed. His true nature was coming out. In fact, that's what John chapter 1, verse 1 is on. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word uh, was God. And then you go on down to verse 14, and it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father. In other words, this wasn't the glory of God shining upon him. This was the glory of God coming out of him. This is who he was. He was the glory of God. And so I don't believe that the glory that Elijah or Moses showed up in here is their glorified state. They were appearing in whose glory? Not their glory, in his glory. They appeared in the glory of Jesus, not yet glorified, not yet metamorphosized, but simply in their countenance, they were changed as a testimony to the life of a believer who dies in the Lord Jesus. And that's true for us. Isn't this what happened to Moses when he came down from receiving the law at Mount Sinai? The Bible says that he was changed. He wasn't changed internally. He was changed because he had been in the glory of God. And you remember when he came down from the mountain, he had to veil his face. The people couldn't even look at him. They had to bow down because they knew that he had been in the glory of God on the top of Mount Sinai. But when Jesus comes, we're not going to appear in glory. We're going to be glorified. We are going to be changed. We're going to be given a glorified body. We're going to be given a new body, a perfect body. Aren't you glad about that, man? I'm glad about that. I'm looking forward to it because I've always wanted a better body. I, you know, I mean, I know I got most of it, but I, I need more. You know, go ahead, don't laugh. I don't need no laughs now. Let's just be honest here. I, I mean, you know, it's I, I want all I'm supposed to get. Yes, bless us. Yes, Lord. I mean, that's what, that, and so the Bible tells us that the day is going to come when it's a glorified body. It's a perfect body made by him. And that's what the Bible tells us. Behold, I tell you, Paul said this. He said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. How fast is that? Just like that. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet of God's going to sound, the dead are going to be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. We will be glorified. And we will not be redecorated. We will not be take this body and remake it. It will be a new body. It will be a perfect body. It will be a glorified body because we will be in the presence of of Almighty God, of Jesus. And did you know the amazing thing is that all of that is interwoven and intertwined with the fact that Jesus is who he is. 1 John chapter 3 says, It's not yet appeared what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Why? Because we shall see him as he really is. And folks, I want to tell you something. We have yet to see the glory of God in all of its majesty. But at that day, in his presence, we will be glorified. We will be new. We will be changed. And that's what we see by evidence in the life of Elijah. Elijah, his appearance, his countenance was changed. Their whole countenance was made new. And that's what's going to happen with us. And so he lived. Elijah lived. Moses lived. And that's what Jesus said. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who believes in me shall never die. So guess what? Elijah lives on. 
Now, did he, did he actually live on this, this planet? Absolutely. Was he literally? God didn't take him and hide him out somewhere behind some bush. And then, and then just do something in terms of a resurrection or something like that. No, God, God didn't hide him. He didn't make him invisible. He actually took him from this earth. And yet today he still lives. Here he is as evidence of that. 850 years later, he's still fully alive and fully well in the countenance of glory. And so because of the continuation of his life, we get to see some things. We get to see some things that will be true for us as well one day. We get to see his conversation. We understand what the topic of conversation is going to be. It's going to be all about Christ. It's going to be all about Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the redemption that he's offered, the salvation. That he's it's going to be all about him. That's going to be the topic, the theme of our conversation. And then our countenance, we're going to be new. We're going to be fashioned and framed all new because we're in the presence of the glory of Almighty God. Finally, we get to see, because of the continuation of his life here, we get to see his concealment, verses 4 through 8. You notice in verse 4, Peter got so excited, and this is typical for Peter. He got so excited. He said, now, Lord, this is, this is pretty good stuff. This is pretty good. He said, this is a good thing for us to be here. And that's just another way of saying I'm liking where I am. And so he said, Lord, this is great. Why don't I just build us a tabernacle? Well, let me just do this. Why don't we build three tabernacles? I'll build one for you. I'll build one for Moses. And we'll build one for Elijah. And we'll just stay here forever and we'll not go back. We'll just stay right here. Now, can't you just imagine what that must have been like? To be in the presence of Jesus in all of his glory. Not to mention Elijah, who certainly was the, that representative from the period of the prophets. And who was so loved by so many Jews, by all the Jews, that they used to keep a chair open all the time at the table at Passover. Always available in case Elijah returned. They loved Elijah. They loved Moses. And so here they were in the presence of, uh, of Moses, who was the giver of the law, who changed the course, who, who was their, their Old Testament equivalent of Jesus, the redeemer in the Old Testament. So they loved him. So can't you imagine what it must have been like for Peter, James, and John to see these, to see Jesus, to see Moses, to see Elijah, all there. But you know what Peter's mistake was? Here's, here's, here's the mistake that he made. The mistake that he made was not his suggestion to build the tabernacle. The mistake that he made was that he equated Moses and Elijah to Jesus. And that was the mistake that he made. That he would dare even equate Moses and Elijah and put them on the same plane with Jesus. He was perfectly prepared to make them equal. Moses equal to Jesus, Elijah equal to Jesus, Jesus equal to them. And that's a mistake that we may make here on this earth. But I want to tell you, it's a mistake that will never, ever happen in glory. Ever. Did you notice what happened in verse 5? Soon as he did this, and this was his mistake, soon as he did this, no sooner that he had gotten that out of his mouth and off his lips, the Bible says while he was still speaking, now watch this, while he was still speaking, God took Moses and he took Elijah and he concealed them. He hid them. Where? In a cloud. He just hid them. You know why? Because not even the prophet Elijah and not even the lawgiver Moses should ever be set on the same plane. Not even if it were Abraham himself should he do it. And so Elijah lived on. And because we can see him in this continued state of living, even though we know that he was removed and taken literally from this earth, we're able to get in on the theme of his conversation, on the conversation that's going on in glory, on the countenance that exists in terms of the fact that there is a change that happens and we are in a glorified state and then we see his concealment. 
And we come to understand from that that we're just in the background. We're, we're, we're in the background. We'll, we'll not be interested anymore at that point in the recognition or in the praise of humanity. Our desire at that point is simply going to be to see Jesus and to worship Jesus and to sing to Jesus. And to, and to join in that grand cacophony of praise to Jesus. It, the more I read this, the more I thought about that, that song by Michael English. Do you all remember that? I bowed on my knees and cried holy. You, you remember that? I can't even remember all the words. But I, but I remember the scenario and the story and what he was talking about. And it was how one of his loved ones had died and gone on to glory. And how he entered into the heavenly ranks. And he talks about how he saw Abraham there. And he saw Isaac. And he saw Jacob. All of the progenitors of the faith. All of the, all of the, all of the fathers of the faith. All of those that brought forth the people of God. And he said, I saw all of them. There was Abraham. There was Isaac. There was Jacob. Then he said he, he, he walked on and he, and he sat down with Timothy. And he talked with Mark. But then he said there came the point where he just decided that he hadn't seen the one person he cared about the most. And so he said to Timothy, Timothy, I want to see Jesus. For he's the one who died for me. And that's really what it's all about. Jesus takes front and center. And you and I fall into the background. And everyone else, as great as they may have been, pales into the background as Jesus is centralized in all things. I remember D.L. Moody asking, reading about how D.L. Moody asked Miss Fanny Crosby, he said on one occasion to Miss Fanny Crosby, who wrote most of the hymns, by the way, that are, that are in the, uh, the hymnal that we have. Miss Fanny Crosby, who is a phenomenal songwriter, but she was blind. And so D.L. Moody said to her, Fanny, I, I want you to know that I've been praying that God will one day heal you so that you'll be able to see. And she said, Moody, she said, I've been praying that God would never do the thing like that. And D.L. Moody said to her, well, well Miss, Miss Fanny, I thought that you'd like to be able to see something before you left this earth. She said, why in the world? She said, don't ever pray that God will heal me. She said, because if I don't ever get healed here, the first sight that I ever see will be Jesus who saved me. We're not going to work or look to see men. We're going to look to see the one who died for me. And there's going to be that conversation that goes on and on for all eternity about the gospel and what Jesus did. There's going to be this countenance that we're living in, in the glory, glorified. And there's going to be this concealment of men and this revealing of the Savior of all. So I want you to know Elijah lives on. Moses lives on. Abraham lives on. Elijah walked and talked and breathed the same air that you and I do on this earth. He was a literal man sent to a literal nation with a literal need. And when we saw God take him in a literal whirlwind, he literally took him. But when we see him in Matthew chapter 17, we literally see him alive and well. Not so much because we see him in Matthew 17. And not so much because this, this world will, again, will see him again according to Revelation 11. But because Jesus said this. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me. Though he were dead. Yet shall he live. Everyone who believes in me 
shall never die. And so the question for us at the end of the life of Elijah is just as he had a continuation of life, will we? Will we? Now let me explain about what it means to believe in Jesus. It's far more than head knowledge. And here's why. Because the Bible tells us that Satan himself believes that Jesus was alive and well. Satan himself believes that Jesus went to the cross. So, so it's more than a head knowledge. It's more than just saying that you believe in Jesus because there are hundreds and thousands of people all over this globe who love mama, who love baseball and apple pie and Jesus. And they believe. And that's all. It's right here. But it's never traveled to the heart, that 18 inches. So belief is not just a head knowledge. Belief is when you and I are willing to put everything that we are on the fact that he died for us, that he went to Calvary's cross for us. You've seen me illustrated a thousand times by that using that stool or that chair or the airplane. And how many times have I illustrated using the airplane <coughs> with somebody who says, I believe it can get me to Hawaii. I believe if I get on an airplane, it's going to get me to Hawaii. But if that airplane takes off and you're left standing there, right there in the terminal, do you really believe that airplane's going to get you to Hawaii? No. It's not until you get on it. It's not until you put everything that you are on that that you really demonstrate you believe. And so the question is, do you, have you put everything that you are on the fact that Jesus Christ went to Calvary's cross. He died a cruel and ignominious death for you, for your sins. And he rose again that you might have life. And life more abundantly. Have you really done that? Or do you just head believe? It takes something to have that. He who believes in me. Though he were dead. Yet shall Let's stand for prayer. No one looking around. Every eye closed. No one looking around. Every eye closed. It might just be you. You've come through this entire study of the life of Elijah. You've seen his obedience. You've seen his walk with the Lord. You've seen how the Lord has provided for him. You've seen the difference that God made in his life. And now you say, you know what? I want that kind of life. I want to have that kind of walk with God. That God would change my life. That I'd be able to honor him and serve him. That I could have that confidence one day. That the continuation of my life will go on. That my life will one day be in glory with him. But let me tell you, you can, you can, you can mess that up. And here's how you mess it up. By doing nothing. And as we've said so many times, by, simple, by simply default by simple default you'll split hell wide open if you never do anything and so my question to you today is will you believe not just with your head but with your heart will you place your faith in jesus christ acknowledge that you're a sinner repent from that sin turn away from your sin and turn toward jesus let him be the lord and caller of the shots of your life let him call the shots and let him direct you in everything will you do that will you give him your life today with every head bowed and every eye, uh, every eye closed, I'm going to pray. And in the moment, in just a moment, our music's going to play softly. Now, while it's playing and your heads are bowed, eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you, every heart pray and every eye closed, everybody pray. There may be one or two that need to give their hearts to Christ this day. If so, then you just step out from where you are and you come to me and you tell me, you know what, I don't know what's going on, but I need to know this. Father God, you know the things that are going on in our lives. You know us better than we know ourselves. And you know that in this house today, there may be one, two, three, or ten that, that, are, that are apart from you. They've believed with their head, but they've never believed with their heart. And, and if you were to return today and call your people to yourself to meet you in the air, those would be left. Those would be separated. And they would be forever isolated, apart from God forever. 
And so, God, for those that are in this house today that know that and your Holy Spirit is convicting them, convincing of their sin right now, I pray that you'll call them to yourself today. Even as that song said before we stood up, that, that, you'll, that your arms, they would know your arms are open wide, that you call them to yourself today and that they will obey and they will follow.